So um, today we are going to talk about uh, new technologies uh, in modern conflicts. And I'm very glad to welcome here the distinguished panel. Uh, my name is Helidir Maglar. I'm a distinguished fellow at the um, German Marshall Fund Tech Program. Uh, I have background in NATO and European Union, where I was setting up the cybersecurity policies and also in the Estonian government. And today we are here to talk about um, the study that our colleague Anna Mishin um, has prepared. But before we go um, to the um, uh, presentation of the study, I would like to also introduce briefly our panelists. Uh, Anna Mishin holds PhD in law and is a co-founder and director of the Institute of Innovative Governance. She's pursuing research uh, uh, on innovation, technology and law. And previously, she worked with the resident coordinator office of the United Nations in Ukraine. She has been actively involved in projects um, on innovation and governance. And uh, she also has studied at the University of Tartu, which is in Estonia. And as I am an Estonian, I'm glad that uh, people have studied in Estonia. Uh, she also has developed several online tools to strengthen democracy and human rights in Ukraine, such a inclusive web checker, um, lobby bot and e-women. She also has coordinated other projects related to cybersecurity, data protection and digital rights in Ukraine and Eastern partnership countries. Then we have today with us Tetiana Avdieva, uh, who is a senior legal counsel at Digital Security Lab in Ukraine, a member of the Independent Media Council and an expert of the Expert Committee on Artificial Intelligence under the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. She co-authored the media law reform in Ukraine and is currently engaged in AI governance processes both in Ukraine and on the Council of Europe level. Then we have Victoria Wojcicka as an expert on AI development and regulation. She blends legal and technical expertise into rapidly evolving landscape with a proven track record across various European jurisdictions and educational background uh, from law and computer science. And later on, um, Mr. Oleg Tugno is going to join us, who is a, a AI unit manager and AI regulation lawyer uh, in the um, uh, Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Digital Transformation. Um, and today we are going to talk about the study that Anna has produced. Um, the, this discussion today takes place in the framework of Rethink, Central Eastern Europe Fellowship of the German Marshall Fund and marks the launch of the um, uh, 2023 fellow Anna Mission's policy paper, Advanced Technologies in the War in Ukraine, Risks for Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, this paper is also now available uh, at the GMF's website. And um, Rethink uh, Central East Europe is a year-long non-residential fellowship, which is operated under the um, GMF uh, Transatlantic Trust supporting young researchers and analysts under 35 from the regions of Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, South Caucasus and Western Balkans. Um, the applications for 2025 cohort will be open in late October. Uh, and uh, if you would like to learn more about this GMF web uh, about this fellowship, then please visit GMF website. Um, also, uh, on the housekeeping, uh, please uh, uh, keep the comments and uh, discussions to the Chatham House rule here. And uh, all the questions to the panelists, we are um, reading from the Q&A box. So the questions shall be answered um, if you write the question to us, and I will read them out uh, from the um, chat box. Uh, there will be no floor given to the participants as we have uh, roughly 80 participants today. Um, and with these administrative remarks, I would like to give the floor to Anna. Please present your paper. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Halle, for the introduction. And I would share my screen with you if you allow uh, for a moment. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honored uh, to be here at the German Martian Fund to speak about the topic that holds uh, immense relevance not only for Ukraine, but for the world, the role of advanced technologies in modern warfare and their a profound impact on the democracy and human rights. Uh, before I dive into the details, I would like to extend again my huge thank you to the GMF for this invaluable support during all this time and particularly in the development of my paper. So uh, the full-scale invasion in February 2022 sparked a rapid advancement in Ukraine's defense technologies. And while this cutting edge technology has been crucial in Ukraine defense efforts, they also pose some threats for democracy and human rights. And Ukrainian government collaboration between uh, with technology companies highlights the profound integration um, have um, on our defense strategies and capabilities. But um, for, but for instance, we can see on the slide there's lots of advanced technologies been using since before, and uh, for instance, since the beginning of the invasion, the remote sensing technology uh, you can see <laughs> uh, has been has become a crucial tool indeed, and it has been vital in documenting war crimes committed by Russian forces and providing real time situation awareness of the battle on the battlefield. So the use of these satellites and remote sensing technologies, in particular satellite images, uh, provides invaluable information about events uh, that may have occurred in places that usually are restricted uh, during the war. And it can produce the uh, evidence of mass graves, of movements of armed groups, uh, displaced of populations and also destructions of buildings and lots of other atrocities. And Ukraine used lots of, uh, had the agreements with a lot of satellite companies, uh, like private companies like Maxar Technologies or Planet Labs, and they played indeed a crucial role, a key role in Russia to hold Russia accountable. And for example, uh, when Russia disputed the authenticity of photographs showing the dead civilians in Bucha and for some atrocities, the atrocities in Olenivka, satellite images really provided uh, imagery of those atrocities committed in these remote places. And additionally, these technologies also vital for not only for warfare, but for the uh, post-war reconstructions uh, and post-war recovery, uh, because we have a real huge destruction in Ukraine and it's estimated like more than $100 billion. And the satellite technologies will definitely help us with the post-war reconstruction. Uh, we also have some other technologies that are used in war and it's Delta Situation Awareness System and volunteer technologies. And starting with Delta is a situational awareness system that integrates data from the satellites, uh, drones and other sensors, um, and even uh, ordinary people that report on a, a system like Ivor or Stop Russian War. And it uses AI, it, it, it has integrated AI itself and which process data and identify the kill element types. Um, for this real decision making on the field. So what does technology do? It's with this technology, the so Ukraine can uh, accurately tra track the enemy uh, targets, such as common centers. Um, it's with really unprecedented speed. And the system also can optimize the target for co coordination with the just few minutes. Uh, also, we have volunteer technology, which is a global tech companies that increase collaboration with the ministry digital transformation in Ukraine. And they also use um, AI and uh, satellites in real time, capturing images at specific locations for uh, data collections in a battlefield. And what is really important is to see the possible threats to democracy and human rights using these technologies. 
And we know that technological advancement of the satellite images is uh, really huge, but there to prevent manipulation is also essential uh, because satellite images can be tampered and altered and manipulated by different actors. And we really need strict protocols to regulate this. And we need the regulatory oversight uh, to ensure the transparency and accountability um, and control over all the success data. And another issue, uh, the, it's extensive surveillance, um, which has also threatened privacy, particularly during wartime, uh, where data collection should be limited to lim military necessity and to avoid infringing in human rights. Uh, so about recommendations, I will talk later, but we also have some concerns about the companies which are um, Ukraine using technologies and have agreements like a volunteer company. It's an amazing company, but uh, it's an amazing tool, of course, but also there are some concerns about privacy violations, but moreover, there are some concerns about the contracts and the uh, co-founder of the of this company, which previously supported, for example, Donald Trump, and they've been partnership with U.S. immigration and custom enforcement to identify and deporting illegal immigrants. So it's also posed a risk during war in Ukraine. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, we have a facial recognition technology. Uh, while it really, this technology helped in the identify criminals and reunite families, facial recognition technology also have serious privacy concerns uh, because biometric data, which is used by facial, captured by facial recognition technology, uh, is highly sensible, uh, sensitive, and the misuse could lead to profiling and tracking and violating civil liberties. And what is really important, it's not just like this facial recognition technology is not during war, but also the for the context back in January 2024, the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Ukraine announced that they launched a unified video surveillance platform in Ukraine which is planned to connect more than 5,000 cameras already installed in all the country. And there are some investigations about this uh, uh, unified video surveillance platform, which says that those cameras and installed across Ukraine, they are running the Russian software. And also some of the cameras are Chinese, and why? Because it's really cheaper to buy Chinese cameras rather than from other companies, which is also pose some risks uh, for us and for Ukraine. Uh, we have another company which is really famous, and I think that many of you heard about this, is Clearview AI company. And the government of, of Ukraine used the Clearview AI since March 2022, actually from the almost from the beginning of full scale full scale invasion. And together the main idea was to gather evidence of war crimes to identify Russian criminals and the like also identify other people who are criminals even pro, from both sides. And the company has granted Ukraine the free access to its software, which is interesting. And uh, they are using a huge database from the Facebook, Twitter, and mostly from Vkontakte, which is a Russian platform. It's all like a Facebook, but it's Russian Facebook, we may say. And the, from the positive side, indeed, Clearview AI helped to reunite refugees with their families, identify war victims. They also help to expose Russian undercover agents in Ukraine, but it's again, a pose a serious risks. And in my next slide, I will talk about risks, which uh, is like, while it helped indeed in the identify, in the <laughs> identify war criminals, um, the concern, first concern is of course about the uh, 
general facial recognition technology, which is first of all biased, is AI system, which is usually biased and can prone to errors in bias. And uh, there have been cases where it has misidentified people and search has shown this technology is less accurate when it comes to identify some people from individuals from certain racial, uh, rash, um, racial or ethnical groups. Uh, so it's when it's using facial recognition technologies, there is always a danger relying all, all the time on the technology and algorithm it's, itself. And when we are talking about uh, Clearview AI, which is also interesting, uh, <laughs> the technology has sparked a big debate and concern in Ukraine, particularly regarding the privacy uh, rights and accuracy of the of the platform and human rights organizations many academics in different countries have described the company system as in, um, extremely intrusive technology and countries like france italy uk have fined and restricted clear view ai for violating data protection laws so Ukraine, while using this technology, must ensure that any use of facial recognition technology com must comply with uh, international standards and respect individual rights. Um, well, really interesting, of course, we have AI using AI technologies in information warfare. And, well, Russian informational warfare uh, against Ukraine began way before 2022, um, and even before the advert of the AI technologies. Uh, Russia has invested over $9 billion since 2014 uh, in a propaganda, and they use it, used traditional media and uh, uh, during this time, but since the generative AI became popular, and lots of new tools uh, like uh, deep fakes and wolf cloning technologies uh, started appearing in, in the public. And it also allowed Russians to uh, create a highly realistic and uh, but yet fabricated content. And these tools, for sure, they erode trust. They spread this information. They destabilize societies and Ukrainians. And for instance, we have a famous deep fake video of President Zelensky, which with announce, we, he announced like in this deep fake video, the surrender of military officials. And also some deep fake videos uh, was with um, uh, uh, Zaluzhny uh, and they ordered like, for example, um, our troops to surrender uh, in those deepfake videos are lots of deepfake videos that attempted to deceive and demoralize Ukrainians. And this is evident on platforms like TikTok, which is really interesting, where seemingly harmless pages uh, can be fronts for spreading harmful content. And the effectiveness, of course, um, of this deep, uh, tick, 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 tick TikTok is really huge because they are targeting people, young generation, and they use specific like um, phrases uh, to uh, like about corruption or about among members of parliament or forced mobilization. And of course, people become angry by hearing this. And this is also interesting that um, according to a study in 2023, the Ukrainian trust in local media has decreased from 57% to 29% over the previous year. And this also means that people don't trust uh, traditional media. They usually sit in social media and they consume and they just all the information they see. And there are lots of defects, which is also affects uh, the public perception of the, some political situations. Uh, okay, so interesting and very important questions. And uh, it's like balance between national security and human rights, which is really important because 
uh, in the face of those challenges that we strike, it's uh, important to know to balance between national security and the protection of democratic values and human rights. And while certain risks might be restricted during a time of war, any derogation still must uh, adhere to the principles of necessity and proportionality uh, as outlined of the European Convention on Human Rights. And the principle of proportionality requires that any derogation from human rights um, must be proportionate to the threat face. And th that's really important, but still very interesting issue to discuss. And of course, because I have a time lim limit, I will move to recommendations. And so uh, based on the, on the report, there is really crucial to develop, first of all, comprehensive guidance for firstly regulation of remote sensing technologies. And to, uh, most, uh, most importantly to, um, for the use storage and archiving remote sensing data. Uh, we also need to implement regular assessment to identify potential privacy risks associated with remote sensing, uh, because which is, was a risk that I mentioned previously was alteration and fabrication of remote sensing technology. Uh, we really need to, um, to develop the standards to and also the tools uh, that can safeguard from manipulation and uh, alteration of the technologies. Um, Moreover, it's important while regulating the AI environment and facial recognition technologies, uh, that's really crucial to uh, create a control environment like regulatory sandboxes for safe development and uh, testing uh, and adaptation of AI innovations to ensure that AI technologies meet local safety and compliance and ethical standards before widespread development. Uh, of course, for Ukraine, uh, in time of wars, and uh, just because we are moving towards the European Union, it's also important to implement the and revise the law on personal data protection and to align with this use general data protection regulation. And also we have a new Artificial Intelligence Act, which is also important to revise and to implement some provisions uh, on AI Act in Ukrainian legislation. Um, I also propose to implement a human rights democracy and a rule of law impact assessment for AI systems uh, to ensure these AI systems, they do not undermine human rights and democratic processes, and also to develop a controlled environments for the developers and uh, to ensure that ethical standards are effect effectively applied. Um, talking about the AI disinformation and AI tools like deepfakes and voice cloning, it's of course uh, imperative to, to work with uh, media literacy programs and develop, implement programs um, um, that nurture a critical thinking skills among citizens, starting from schools, the university, working with elderly people, um, and of course, it's important to foster collaboration among governments and technological sector media organizations to work together on capacity building uh, and to be sure that all these technologies that we are using now during war and probably will be using, the state will be using some of them after war, which is also a critical issue, uh, that it is regulated and it will not violate uh, human rights and democracy. Uh, so I hope I'm in time, uh, dear Halle, but thank you so much. You will be able to, to read the paper because there are lots of information and even more that I just had very small time to present. And I will be happy to answer all your questions. And uh, please uh, um, text me if you have an, uh, it will be opportunity, of course, for discussion today. And thank you again for uh, for this opportunity to present.
Thank you, Anna, uh, for this very comprehensive um, study and very good recommendations. And of course, uh, Ukraine is currently a country in war, and certainly there are the wartime rules and peacetime rules, even the international law, as we know, is differentiating uh, uh, wartime and peacetime modes. And as I am also uh, dealing with um, uh, some of the issues in Ukraine, I uh, have seen that uh, uh, the rules of war or international humanitarian law is not breached on the Ukrainian side. And uh, although Delta and all the other uh, systems are used, uh, uh, the Ukrainian military is following the, the principle of uh, human decision making, uh, even if the AI is feeding um, the data, and there are also humans always in the loop who do the final decisions. So therefore, um, I am um, uh, uh, commending and applauding this uh, during the difficult time of war that the troops uh, in Ukraine are able to follow them, the international humanitarian law or law of armed conflict, uh, where all this uh, personality and, uh, and other rules are um, laid down. But however, of course, as uh, Ukraine probably, hopefully, will not be in war for long, and uh, of course, we don't know how it all uh, goes, but uh, uh, as a European Union uh, a candidate country, Ukraine is going to join the European Union soon. And therefore, all these um, recommendations that you made um, are very, laying a very good groundwork for the um, civilian um, development and civilian reconstruction uh, that Ukraine is uh, supposed to be starting uh, soon and then probably will already start during the uh, final stages of war. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, finding the balance between security and human rights, what you have outlined, is, is a very important subject. And uh, thank you for um, also uh, making um, uh, interesting examples how the adversary is using the AI in order to uh, weaken Ukrainian case and, and spreading misinformation and, uh, and also investing into the social media misinformation campaigns significantly. Uh, so the AI is a tool and it is used by people on, for positive and for negative um, purposes. And of course, uh, we know that um, uh, all the uh, experimentation which is going on in Ukraine right now with new technologies is also quite a new situation for, for most of our countries because um, the AI is a new tool, what we, the humans, have, and it has not been tested uh, in many uh, war situations or conflicts before. We have seen it now in Ukraine, and of course we have seen it also in Gaza and other other um, war, war zones, but um, uh, er everything what we learn right now is going to be precedent, and, uh, and we have to learn how to deal with it and how to regulate uh, the usage of these new technologies in modern conflicts, because frankly, we do not have a good rule book how we are going to use these technologies now or in the future. So as we see the examples now, I think these will be very rich examples that help us to develop the rule book for the future. And therefore, all the studies like yours are, are really important. And uh, and thank you for this. So, but um, our other panelists are then now um, discussing your um, study. So first, I would um, give the floor to Tetiana. So, if you, from uh, your perspective, uh, would comment uh, and also maybe uh, add your own um, views uh, on this subject, please, Tetiana. Uh, thank you very much. I see the question in the chat. So. You since it's more linked to what Anna has we, already... We answer the questions later. Please oh, okay. uh, comment as a panelist first, and then we come to the Q&A later. Yeah, uh, so first of all, let me express my heartful gratitude to Anna for such an extensive and deep research. I really appreciate that more and more researchers are actually paying attention to this topic, and I find it particularly interesting and important today to actually collect those experiences and to identify main threats and ways to actually address them. Uh, I probably will limit myself to three key comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I find that this research is very important for future policy making and for uh, how Ukrainian approach towards both 
euro integration in terms of the legal regulation, uh, the development of policies for cooperation with the platforms and with the companies in general on the level of um, horizontal collaboration, let's put it this way, are built. And also how Ukraine designs its exit strategies from human rights restrictions. So from this perspective, I would say that it is really crucial to pay attention to EU standards and view it, uh, I would say, cumulatively in terms of both combined GDPR, AI Act, which was already mentioned in the paper, and it's nice that we're starting to think how to implement it, even though some European countries are not yet there in terms of the development, the, the adequate framework. Uh, and also... I think that it's really crucial, again, to think about the exit strategies as one of the key focuses. And here, I think this research might be of huge help uh, because uh, actually what is important, for example, for such things as Clearview AI, for such things as Palantir and so on, is to understand the limit. So whether we are applying them as a part of the martial law framework as a part of the wartime related restrictions, or we would like to implement, incorporate them in our daily life. I mean, uh, we have already discussed this with Anna, I remember when we had the interviews connected to this research, but I also wanted to reiterate this point for the broader audience that it is particularly crucial to uh, ensure that these intrusive technologies remain the part of the war-related context and war-related framework. Mm -hmm. Because the entire civilized world, uh, democratic nations who are advancing democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, have uh, repeatedly stressed that the intrusive nature of such technologies, especially, especially real-time facial recognition and so on, uh, they cannot be deployed in peace times. There were even court decisions against some of the most infamous companies, I would say. So for Ukraine, and this research, again, can start an amazing starting point for this debate in the legal dimension and in the policymaking dimension, it is important to ensure that we know how to make it adequately in terms of we have lots of companies who provide the essential services in the wartime. And the very same companies actually have other services suitable for peacetime, which are more human rights compliant, more human rights oriented, and so on. And it is important to ensure that there is a communication strategy with the company to, on the one hand, maintain good relations with them and uh, still proceed with collaboration, but in another dimension, which is more uh, oriented at maintaining human rights standards and implementing the EU legislation and the EU standards and so on. And I think that uh, we commonly have to work in that area in order to establish an adequate framework for that. Um, also, I think that this research might be a good starting point for for another discussion and this is a discussion on the overlap of uh, the human rights framework and international humanitarian law uh, because this is another like broad area where like diving into this requires probably not one year even but this is particularly crucial now because of the things going on on the international arena how people are approaching drone technologies how people are approaching the systems of the situational awareness, whether we frame them within the human rights framework or we need to like back it with the IHL standards or even like use the IHL standards where they are lex specialis to the general norms. How can we um, actually treat those technologies in the trade sphere, for example? So stepping a little bit aside from human rights, but still bearing them in mind. How can we, for example, approach dual use technologies? This is one of the probably biggest discourses currently in the EU legal um, legal area on the EU arena. And I strongly believe that what Anna has done is really a great firstly mapping on what we currently have in terms of the personal data protection and the tech 
And secondly, it is a very, very good start for further discussions and delving deeper into the very peculiar and particular um, debate on how to approach this technology. Uh, and I'm also uh, really very satisfied by the fact that it combines both perspectives of civil society, academia, and the government. So I strongly believe that in the future, we will be able to involve all of those stakeholders to develop the common solutions. I will probably stop here, but we'll be happy to discuss more like specific topics and things further on. Thank you once again for this input. Thank you, Tatiana, for your very uh, good and comprehensive comments. Um, and now on my list of panelists, uh, I have Mr. Oleg Dubno, who is the AI unit manager and uh, AI lawyer at the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. So you uh, did not hear Anna's presentation, but I assume you are aware of, of her work. So uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Can you comment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation for this discussion. Yeah, I've seen the research. Uh, Anna, thank you for your great work. It's really insightful and useful for us. Uh, talking about the AI regulation in Ukraine from the side of the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, uh, we do a lot of work. Uh, we pay a lot of attention on AI regulation in Ukraine. Uh, this summer, we published white paper on AI regulation. Uh, this is the uh, version for public uh, consultation. Uh, so we gather like the information from civil society, from the experts, how better regulate AI in Ukraine in such a way that uh, it's pro-innovative uh, and at the same time uh, protects human rights, uh, human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Uh, so uh, our approach is a bottom-up approach. That means that we work with the civil society, business and experts to develop a, a responsible approach to the use of AI in Ukraine in different sectors, in different spheres. Uh, for the first, uh, what we do is that we publish uh, recommendations, guidelines uh, for the uh, different sectors. Uh, we've developed uh, the guidelines for uh, media sphere, uh, the, the guidelines for the um, uh, secondary schools uh, educational educational guidelines, also the guidelines for uh, advertisement and marketing sphere. Uh, also, we published together with uh, the Office of Ukrainian Ombudsman the guidelines on the AI and uh, personal data. So this is how we. Uh, come to the regulation uh, on of AI in Ukraine. Uh, also, we work uh, with the experts on the uh, general guidelines for the uh, developers of AI solutions. Uh, we want to uh, recommend uh, to the providers of uh, AI systems and to the developers of AI systems uh, how how to develop the system in such a way that uh, it uh, contains this so-called privacy by design principles, yes, human rights first, and and uh, so on. Uh, also, talking talking about the recommendations that um, Anna presented uh, earlier, uh, we also uh, develop and is established the regulatory sandbox. Uh, it must be launched uh, by the end of this year. This would be the controlled environment where the companies can test their solutions uh, and uh, can uh, test if it's compliant with the AI Act, uh, ISO standards and uh, human rights standards. And so uh, we want to protect human rights uh, also to integrate these privacy by design principles from the very beginning of the developing uh, AI systems. Uh, also, uh, human rights uh, uh, impact assessment, uh, uh, the the frame the methodology which was uh, which is now on, on on the work of the Council of Europe. 
uh, food area. Uh, we also take part uh, as a ministry uh, in the work of the Committee of Artificial Intelligence in the Council of Europe. And we uh, will uh, also adapt Huderia methodology in Ukraine after it is uh, finally adopted in the Council of Europe. Um, what about other activities that uh, we uh, do? We hold some educational events um, to foster AI literacy. Uh, for example, we uh, had a event together with the Adobe, uh, who, who are the, uh, the company which is the leader of the content authenticity initiative. And we uh, had the event where we uh, discussed uh, the uh, AI the disinformation challenges uh, in, in, the, in our age. So this is kind of a short uh, description of our work in the ministry. Uh, we also understand all the challenges that come up with the uh, past development of AI. Uh, thank you very much once again, Anna, for your recommendations. Uh, we would like also to stay in touch with you and uh, to, to bring more of your expertise uh, also to the work uh, in the Ministry of Digital Transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dubno, and I'm very glad to hear that Ukraine already is implementing so many of those regulatory uh, uh, steps and also the uh, privacy by design framework was very interesting what you have described. And I'm sure that um, once the war is over, then the, the, the preparations for the EU membership will be, sped, will be speeding up and, and then all the harmonization of the laws with the EU regulatory frameworks also will probably accelerate the adoption of uh, of the GDPR and all the other um, EU privacy laws. So, uh, But uh, we also have one more expert on the panel that uh, also has been familiar with the work uh, that Anna did. So, Victoria, uh, please, uh, we are also eager to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to Anna and her work You've done indeed titanic work in gathering all this insight in one paper. And I believe that that will be both beneficial for the government and for the companies to amend the strategies. I've also prepared a short presentation to comment and reflect on your paper with three main ideas. So without further ado, I'll share my screen and proceed. So can you yes. see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. So reading your paper, I was ask myself, asking myself one question. So Ukraine has adopted an approach to leave the defense out of sphere, of sphere of regulation. And I was asking myself, so is this lack of regulation in the white prevails, the risks or the possibilities? So first of all, I would like to take a look on transparency requirement. So we all know that in IA Act, we have a lot of requirements to AI systems and models, one of which is transparency requirement. It implies that the data for the data sets, the disclosing data for the data sets, algorithms, also where the information is stored and who it belongs to. But what are the risks here? So first of all, if we know the data system was trained on, the algorithms it used, so we could um, make the system our own and we have a risk of interference in this system. So if you know how the data operates, with which data it operates, we can interfere in this system, hack it and use it for our own good. We can also predict the outcome of the model and also manipulate the result of this data. Another risk is the risk of storage destruction. So if we know that where data is stored and who it belongs to, we have risk of destruction of this data and also a risk to straighten the owner or to kill the owner of this system. So we have a lot of risks, but what are the possible solutions? First of all, I think that the approach that we have now in Ukraine is the perfect solution because we cannot just copy paste the regulation to the 
time of war, we cannot just copy paste into the defense systems. And the solution that I found most suitable are the flow regulations, such as recommendation, how could we develop, how can we use AI in defense. It's also the self-regulation, for example, voluntary code of conduct on responsible AI use and development of AI. That's basically what the Ukraine ministry is doing right now. And when we talk about recommendation and code of conduct, I would like to highlight that essential point in this solution is that we need to make sure that big market players are an active part in putting this regulation as no one other could know what are the possible risks and solution in defense sphere other than the companies who actually develop the solutions. Another thing that was already mentioned here is the sandbox and Hudaria methodology. That will be essential to test uh, how the process are built, to test it in kind of insulated environments without posing real risks to human rights. Second one, we have not really discussed this, but it's essential to draw your, your attention to the question of collaboration. So as we all know that the systems, the, the platforms such as YouTube, Meta, like Facebook and Instagram, they have a content moderation. We should make sure that the content which could be offensive or upsetting is deleted within 24 hours. But we all know also that YouTube and Instagram is not only the platform to share the selfies and the pictures of your dog. It has now become a safe place where you can speak and be heard. It's a place where you can share your political views, where you can express things that you care for. And what we have now with the war in Ukraine is that videos in YouTube where people talk about the situation in Ukraine, talk about the results of bombing, these videos are getting age restricted, taken down, the creator is added to the blacklist, or the YouTube channel is demonetized. When we talk about Instagram, the pictures, the videos of the bombing with a hashtag like a Bucha, Russian is aggressor, stand with Ukraine, is also usually getting blocked. And it's not only about like risk of getting the human rights violation, like right to expression, self-expression, like to, right to freedom of speech, but it also has posed some risk to deleting the evidence of crime. Because people who, for example, are located in Mariupol or in the battlefield, they could, they could upload this video, which will also contain the evidences of war crimes. And this video will be just taken down due to the committee guidelines, community guidelines. But the question is, would the rules and the guidelines created in a time of peace be applicable in a time of war? Or should we rethink the patterns that was in the basis of these guidelines? So, are violation of self-expression, violation of freedom of speech. And what is more important here is where could this video be stored? Videos of evidences of, of war crimes. So if we talk about civils, they don't have access to special registers or archives, but the thing that they have is access to internet and social medias. So that is a very quick and safe way to share what is really going on. And what could be the possible solutions? First of all, we really need to rethink what we put in these guidelines, recommendation, community rules. And we need to make sure that this Guidelines, they reflect the reality we are living in right now. Second is the trusted flaggers. So that will be useful for two cases. First of all, if your content is taken down, you make sure you have the right to kind of recreate this content, to gain access to this content, content to share what you think, what you feel about the situation and not be banned for that. And that's where trusted flaggers could be really useful. As we all know, there are some mechanisms in the system in Instagram and YouTube, but individual claims will never be such effective as collective claims, uh, which was done through the trusted flagger mechanism. Also, another case where trusted flaggers could be essential 
is when we talk about deep fakes, especially deep fakes of the politicians. So when we talk about trusted flaggers, we need to make sure that we don't just copy paste what is written in the DSA, but we need to make sure we tailor all this mechanism and um, scope to the needs of Ukrainian society, highlighting the needs of, for example, as we discussed in the previous slide, a content being banned from the platforms or uh, deep fakes of the politicians. So we need to make sure that these trusted flaggers uh, kind of prevail the needed for now claims to be uh, to be resolved. And last solution or last question that we have unsolved is where this piece of evidences could be stored. So that will they will be remain in court, remain accessible in court. And at the same time, that will be easy for the civils to upload and share this evidence is online. And the last question I would like to discuss right now is mis and disinformation. Probably the first thing you think about is we need more regulation, we need more mechanism, we need more soft law. But the thing is, I would like to draw your attention to another problem. We for sure can come up with another law, another regulation, recommendation. But despite on despite of finding a solution to spot a deep fake, we also need to think about where do we find the real information, the truth information. And that's why I would like to draw your attention to the slide. This is a slide from Mikola Makotich presentation when he showed the results of the chat DPT BART, which is now called Gemini, ask question about history of Ukraine. And as we can see right now, so the BART has responded like a 50% of truth when it comes to the question of Ukraine history. If the question was asked in English, if the question was asked in Ukrainian, the information was less reflect, uh, was reflecting the truth kind of in the last manner. So what conclusion can we draw from this slide? Despite on focusing on creating a new regulation, new solution to spot a deepfakes, we also need to provide a solutions to actually share the truth, share the precise information. And how could we do that? Basically, we can start by translating Ukrainian content to English and to share the information about our history, our perception, and what is really going on in our territory. Second, we need also to enable the creation of Ukrainian and English content and provide this access to information to the white public. And if we go to conclusions, so I have raised three questions, transparency, content restrictions, and misdemeanor information. And three main idea would be for the first question, we need to make sure that big players take active part in self-regulation. And this voice, their voice, their position is heard and in we would like to publish. Second, when we talk about content restrictions, we need to remember that rules made in a time of peace do not work in a time of war. And we need to rethink the patterns that is in the basis of the guidelines. Third point, when we talk about this and misinformation, we need to focus not only how to spot the deep fakes and other technical solutions, but also we need to focus on enabling the particular information, the precise information both in Ukrainian and English to the wider, wider public. And the final slide I would like to present that instead of focusing to create new law, new regulation, we need to focus on creating a culture of self-regulation, adopting old laws to the new challenges and new reality we are living in, and also enable new solution to share information on what is going on with the wider public in English and in other languages. That was kind of a brief reflection of Anna's paper. And if you have other questions, I would be very interested in discussing it. So I left my contacts just in case. Uh, thank you, uh, Victoria. I think it was really interesting what you just have said about the 
uh, platforms uh, um, and uh, the, the issue of where shall we actually uh, collect all this data about the war crimes and, and how we enable the evidence gathering here in this field. Uh, so uh, can I have an immediate follow-up question? Sure. Is there anything that Ukrainian government has set up for this, uh, like where you can issue those videos or send the information, or is it mostly people are just uh, spreading it in the, I think Telegram is now banned, partly in Ukraine, right? And people do not want to use TikTok always. Uh, I understand Twitter or X with the new name doesn't almost censor or regulate anything. So it's uh, everything goes in X. Uh, but the Instagram and YouTube are more widespread than uh, Twitter, and and so what's the situation? I'm it's I'm just curious. I have not really looked into this, and uh, I think Anna Anna has also answered. But Victoria, I will give you a chance to give your answer first. So I cannot speak on behalf of ministry, but if you are asking my opinion, so as an expert, as an expert, yeah, uh, I will not be talking as a ministry uh, representative, but as an expert. I would like to say that it's not uh, the responsibility of the government to set up uh, some kind of an archives or safe places to share the information. The question that I brought up is that the platform they self, themselves should change their approach to this because uh, social media is not just a platform to share a selfie or the picture of the dog. It is this. It should be the safe place to share what you really care about to have a self-expression. And me as Ukrainian, I would like to share pictures of what is going on in my country. I would like to share with my friends, my foreigner friends, what is really going on. So it's more the question to the platforms, how could they adopt their guidelines, community guidelines to the reality we are living on right now? Because if we just read the first paragraph of the community guidelines, it said that like, we would like to be the safe place when you can be yourself, share what you care about, but that's not true. You cannot really be yourself if you cannot share the information about your country and who you are and what you are care, what you, what you care for. So uh, answering your question, I would like to say that, okay, Ukraine as a country who is now in the state of war could set up the different archives and safe places but the question is that social media is something that everyone has access for. And sharing the evidences could be something that accessible. So we all have the cell phones, we all have access to Instagram, and that will be the easiest way to share these evidences. And it's not the question to the country to set up different apps and platforms. It's more the global question to the platforms. How could we adopt to reality we are living in? Thank you. I now understand your point. Yes, you you rather ask the platforms to uh, adopt to the reality. Um, if you know, I'm roughly twenty years older than you guys, and I have never used Instagram. I must confess. So for me, Instagram a platform wouldn't be <laughs> working. So we have to think something uh, also in generational lines. But um, I think Anna had a comment. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, and thank you so much, Victoria, Tatiana, and Lech, for your presentation and comments. I would just put, wanted to briefly reflect with what Victoria said, because it's really interesting question, and I think I touched a little bit regarding to the remote sensing technology in terms of data archiving and collection for evidence, because we, as we know, we have lots of open source uh, data in, in the internet regarding uh, Russian aggression and atrocities, and indeed, it's a big issue about the collection of all this data, especially we're talking the satellite images and collection of satellite images, but also all the open source investigation, uh, because we're using media, like videos from the YouTube, different media from, as you mentioned, from Telegram and all other platforms, and we have or seen as investigators in Ukraine, particularly in this related to the general prosecutor office in Ukraine, that they have been collecting evidence for of war crimes. And the issue is like, where to archive all this data and as Victoria mentioned that if you delete the data from the internet how to prove and that it was an it is an evidence and because there is admissibility criteria in international criminal court and in Ukraine 
what what should evidence be to be admissible in the court it can be a proof of the chain of custody and authenticity of the evidence right and it's a big issue now in Ukraine because we do have a platform, the centralized platform of collecting war crimes evidence. But as been mentioned, that there are lots of civil society organizations and journalists that are collecting those evidence and they are keeping there on their own platforms, like a, even like Google Doc, right? And it's important what to do with all this evidence because you need to prove the chain of custody, uh, custody to make it admissible in the court. So what does it mean? It means that you need to prove how was it collected? Was it the initial source of information? Where it's original uh, evidence? So, and if you delete the content from the media, like for example, YouTube, then of course there are some tools like our archive, I think there's like an archive uh, data machine or some tool that really can throw you back time and see what, um, what was the evidence during like last year or like what 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 was on this platform like last year in this very specific time but still it's difficult because you also need to prove all that metadata being collected and not being deleted and altered because we are here talking also about the alteration of the data and how it's easy to manipulate for instance in 2014 we remember the crash of the um, uh, airplane that happened that the Russian uh, heated their airplane from Netherlands like flying across Ukraine and it's a huge disaster and what happened the Russians accused Ukrainians of heating the plane and they manipulated and altered data specifically satellite images and they uh, provided those altered satellite images to the court in hug but still we have some tools to prove that it's data is this data has been manipulated so it's really important to so save all the metadata and to prove all this chain of custody, of course, uh, working with big platforms, like it should be a cooperation between platforms and the government about the content moderation and deletion, um, to how, about the, um, the content should be deleted or not. And this is really a great topic to, I think, for further discussions, but it's really important that thank you for mentioning this. And thank you all the colleagues too, for all your comments. And we have so many things to talk about. Uh, this topic is really important. And I think we kind of diverted from your original paper topic a bit here. But if somebody else would like to comment on this um, uh, collecting the data and enabling the um, um, data collection for uh, um, uh, trying the war criminals later, then please come in, Oleg, uh, Victoria. Nobody wants to comment on that because it goes beyond that. <laughs> uh, um, oh, Tatiana, please. Uh, yeah, so just a brief comment. I think that it partly might be resolved by the framework of Digital Services Act, which provides the uh, mechanism for collaboration between the state and the platform. And it, at least to a certain degree, might help us to avoid those logistics details and logistics challenges, which we face currently because Ukraine doesn't have jurisdiction upon the biggest platforms. So for us, it is relatively difficult to collaborate them on every single issue we want. And secondly, again, it is the question of firstly defining the purpose for these um, data preservation and defining the responsible authority. Uh, for, uh, to the best knowledge of mine, currently in Ukraine, um, the Office of the Prosecutor General actually is responsible for collection of data, including, um, I wouldn't say scrapping, but at least like uh, collecting data from the social media, which is sent to the Office of the Prosecutor General. And this is done together by multiple NGOs, including international NGOs, like Truth Hounds, like Global Rights Compliance, lots of local NGOs as well. So probably it is not the um, task of the ministries in terms of Ministry for Digital Transformation or Ministry of um, information policy and strategic communications as it is called now uh, as like as the uh, targeted like uh, state authorities but apparently there are other state organs which 
are indeed responsible for the things. And probably we just have to identify the actors in this area and then to develop the mechanism. And again, I think that a more faster process of your integration in terms of implementation of DSA and DMA might facilitate resolution of this issue just because it will provide the adequate mechanism, which is legally uh, backed by certain regulations, which are also compulsory on the EU level. Thank you, uh, Tatiana, because I think this is an important question also for the audience to understand. And thank you for clarifying that there is a place in Ukraine where you can collect this evidence. But of course, uh, we also have to work with the platforms. So, but coming back now to uh, uh, our original study uh, made by Anna and the um, question of the uh, usage, usage of new technologies and AI uh, uh, and the human rights implications of usage of AI. Uh, then we have encouraged uh, our participants to submit the questions online, and we have a couple of questions. So first I see here, uh, Adnan Somro has asked uh, uh, from Victoria about the slides, uh, whether uh, she can share the slides uh, uh, on, on screen. I don't know, Victoria, are you comfortable to do that or what's your policy there? Sure, sure. I could send the slides to Anna so yeah. it could be shared. Yeah, then uh, yeah, the GMF team probably can share it with the participants later on. And then there is a question in the chat um, from Anna Melanchuk. Uh, and the question is, um, how do, it's uh, to Anna, uh, how does Ukraine ensure that the use of advanced technologies like AI and facial recognition in warfare adheres to the principle of proportionality and what legal safeguards are in place to prevent their misuse beyond military necessity? This is a very good legal question and I'm sure that uh, good lawyers can uh, respond to that. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's indeed a legal question and we've been discussing it. It's again, it's a balance between the use technologies uh, for national security and protection for human rights and uh, the Ukraine um, ensures that the use of the advanced technologies like AI and facial recognition adheres with the principle of proportionality uh, through the combination of legal, uh, regulatory and oversight frameworks rooted both in a, a national and international law, um, particular to, particularly international humanitarian law. And proportionality uh, required these military operations and that using the, those technologies that we've been talking about um, that are strictly necessary and that their impact on civilians is minimized. And because we know that, and when Tatiana mentioned about the humanitarian law as a less specialist, and it's a big discussion because we have international hum, uh, humanitarian law, international human rights law, and we have principles that are being used like uh, in, in wartime, like right principle of distinction, principle of proportionality. And when we're using technology, we need to understand that it's proportionate, that the data that being used are minimized, and used for specific purposes, right? And during my presentation, I already mentioned that our threats like being using for facial recognition technologies, right? The data being collecting, for example, with all this new draft law in the ministry, even after war, like uh, for 15 years, I think there's a, a draft law that they've been collecting data uh, and like making like surveillance over all public places and say uh, storing data for 15 years. So we need to understand, for instance, like for what purposes are uh, they they're going to store the data, collect the data for such long time, where they will use this data to target a specific group. And there are lots of cases where the agencies and uh, governmental agencies or other actors being using data, facial recognition, biometric data, to target specific groups of populations, like for their ethical, religious, and some maybe political views. So we need to keep all these principles and to balance against the national security and human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Any other views? Somebody want, from the panelists would like to add something? Uh, if not, then uh, I think we have one more. Uh, uh, Victoria, please. 
Yeah, I would like to briefly add to what Anna said. It's also essential to ask these big market players, the AI companies itself, to take an active part. Because we cannot just say that you need to share all this information, how you adhere to principle of proportionality, accountability. We cannot just uh, put these requirements on them without their acceptance, without their permission, because that will not work in this way. So defense, uh, AI, AI defense is such a critical topic right now. And we cannot uh, decrease the innovate innovation with the regulation. So that should be um, kind of in a collaboration a collaboration mechanism and the self-regulation is a good solution here because if we go into discussion with the AI companies we could ask their opinion and come up with the decision with a solution that will be suitable for both government and protecting human rights and the companies and will not decrease the innovation yeah thank you for making this point about innovation uh, as well um, the, the, um, any any other reflections or uh, yeah, Tatiana? Um, I would probably slightly disagree from the side of the civil society because it is crucial to ensure that there is a mechanism which is enforceable, especially in cases where, for example, companies are unable to propose. Uh, a solution which is adequately framing human rights within the work of theirs in Ukraine. And in the case where we do not have uh, some kind of hard law regulation and particular red lines, we are now not speaking about something uh, from this, like from the category of the AI Act, which is super detailed and very uh, well designed for a very specific market. We are rather speaking about the framework regulation. In case we do not have the red lines, we are unable even to, for example, kick the company off from the market for the violation of the particular standard just because we do not have the standard put in place. Uh, and in this case, I mean... It's not only about the companies that are actively collaborating with the government and fostering innovations uh, in order to achieve victory or something like that, but it also concerns the private players that do not cooperate with the government and sometimes might resort to the practices which are human rights abusive in a way. And we need to have instruments to prevent those abuses and to effectively sanction them in any possible way. I mean, like fine them or prohibit certain kind of operations in the territory of Ukraine or something like that. So I would say that it is important to distinguish the government, like private public partnership, where the government is the part of the dialogue and where the government can impact on certain decision making processes and those cases where the government doesn't actively participate and also doesn't have the tools to put pressure on the companies. So those tools probably have to be developed in advance before the incidents happen. Yeah, I think, uh, Tatiana, you're absolutely right. We we have so, uh, we are in a totally new terrain here and uh, there are almost uh, zero regulation in place when it comes to the usage of AI in any of the situations that we have. And all the regulations that we have, even in peacetime now, in the countries that do not have war, are still in the beginning, and we are not able to actually implement those. So uh, AI Act is not implemented yet, and so we are still starting in the EU and, and everywhere else. And, and here we talk about the peacetime. But in wartime, yes, uh, it's uh, um, it's also very new. And, and, and uh, I'm very glad to see such a good group of people thinking about these issues, at least, so I think that Ukrainian experience is something where we all should learn from. Um, so any other reactions to this uh, question specifically? If not, then I am reading the next question online, which is about how much is the latest drone technology aiding Ukrainian forces in combating Russian aggression? It's not exactly AI question, but maybe somebody can just um, make a... Um, a uh, few comments about the drone technology. It is in the Q&A function I see, which is not on the chat. So it's another function here. Maybe if you have uh, 
So uh, are, you, are you comfortable to take up the throne question, uh, Anna? Or I can also answer myself otherwise. Just a small comment on this, because there are also different kind of drones using in Ukraine, for my knowledge. And there are like drones first, like being mentioned, provide uh, real-time intelligence on Russian troop movements and equipped with, uh, with like a uh, movements and equipment. Also, um, those drones that provide uh, information they are um, really critical for targeting and planning military operation because they've been mentioning about this Delta and volunteer system also it's also just not to include only satellite images but drones uh, there are different drones that are used to precision the targeting Russians right uh, and there are some drones um, a kamikaze drones, as, as I recall, there are lots of types of drones and all they're using during war. And uh, again, some of them are very, um, uh, like, definitely to answer this question, yes, there are lots of drones that helping us to combat Russians. And it also need to be regulated as a technology, right? As, as a technology, it should be regulated uh, uh, again for, uh, been, we've been talking uh, for the last one hour. Yeah, we are in a interesting situation where we have drone warfare and uh, first world war, trench warfare at the same time happening in, um, in Ukraine. And um, Yes, uh, I think we, we need more time and another hour and a half for drone questions. So probably um, we are not able to tackle that today, but it's uh, certainly also um, very technology enabled a field and the usage of drones and um, and relies heavily on, on software um, applications. And um, uh, as the technology is, is getting more uh, unified, uh, uh to the core of the battlefield functions so um there is a question how how much the human um uh decision making we can we can afford because sometimes these things happen very quickly and, and then uh i'm just talking now about some theoretical talk not about the situation in ukraine but and for the future warfare analysts and um uh, also the commanders in the battlefield, they have to start uh, learning to uh, uh, do the decision together with the AI and judge whether AI given data is the right data. Because we also know that um, there is also something which is called um, AI poisoning and AI spoofing, which is already possible. Uh, and uh, it is used by belligerent sides on the both sides. Uh, for instance, what is uh, AI poisoning? Um, you can uh, create a false picture of um, troop movements with AI, uh, false AI data, and feed it to your drones or or whatever up there, and then um, it might be that uh, might be that the other side is looking at oh, it's, it's actually the accurate data, but it's uh, not accurate data. So it's um, the, um, the tool of AI is is used um, for so many purposes in the in the modern uh, um, battlefield that um, uh, it takes time before all the military and uh, commanders start um, uh, properly using it, and, and therefore uh, all the um, experiences and lessons we now see in Ukraine, I think, are totally critical for all NATO countries, uh, also uh, for the future. And coming back to the human rights question, um, I think this um, question of how we are um, uh, maybe passing from the wartime situation in Ukraine to the peacetime and how we are uh, then going to do that step uh, from uh, wartime necessity, necessity of using the AI surveillance and AI technologies for either uh, unifying families or identifying war criminals or or um, everything that we need to do in terms of uh, uh, wartime requirements um, and how uh, the population that is used to this kind of usage of AI needs to then relearn a bit when what the war is over. And then uh, starting to do this uh, according to the peacetime uh, uh, principles, 
And I think this is this is very interesting um, way of asking these questions, Anna, and uh, and the, your recommendations of how this regulation and uh, and also the presentation by Oleg, how uh, Ukrainian government already is doing privacy by design. Uh, I think were very encouraging um, examples of uh, of many uh, young lawyers thinking about these issues in Ukraine and and probably being able to implement um, the necessary uh, GDPR and other privacy rules um, uh, once the EU um, joining process is, is going forward uh, in the country. And, uh, uh, and and I'm very hopeful that um, there is a, a very a good expertise and um, uh, a number of uh, informed and educated uh, legal scholars uh, in this field in Ukraine. So um uh, i think we do not have any questions from the floor anymore and um i would maybe like uh, anna and the others just uh, invite to do some uh, very short closing remarks and then we can uh, close our webinar so anna uh, that's your next step so what are you going to do with this study and uh, and uh, and what do you do after your uh, finish your phd now mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you so much, dear Halle, and thank you so much, all the colleagues, for your comments. And it's really, really interesting discussion. And it, it's part the discussion itself inspired me to continue working on these topics. And I'm definitely, I'm really happy having here representatives both from civil society, from Ministry of Digital Transformation, because this is a crucial thing to cooperate together. Because but initial purpose of my research was to provide uh, recommendations for the government. And that's important that the government take into account those recommendations and we can uh, collaborate together. I would be more than happy to, to help and present uh, again for to more colleagues my uh, recommendations to work together and to implement those recommendations into practice because this is like also important, not just talking, but to do something. So it's uh, the government itself is going the right way and implementing lots of things, but I think that uh, us experts in civil society can do even more for, for the state in, ter in times of war specifically. Definitely, I will continue doing this and I have some more, like I said, inspiration to do more work and to maybe write another report or some specific paper on uh, some issues that we discussed today because there are lots of other important things uh, needed to be developed in the future and still we are in war later we i hope the world will end soon and we will have post-war reconstruction we will have even more work to do so and uh, lots of work ahead and i would love to invite all the participants also to collaborate to to write to ask us questions or maybe some of you are working in this area so it'd be great all together to do something uh, for good and again, thank you so much. Thank you, GMF, for supporting this paper because uh, thanks for them. Now it's possible to, to work and to continue working on this. And thank you, Halle, for the great moderation. Thank you, Tatiana, Olaf, and Victoria. You're amazing experts in the field, one of the best in Ukraine. So really, thank you to all of you. Thank you, Anna. And um, I think with that, we can close the webinar. And thank you for the contributions to the panelists. And, and Anna, good luck in your future career. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. So, bye bye.